Good morning, Wesley family. We are so excited to have you joining us again for online worship. My name is Elise Peck, and I serve as the communications coordinator here at Wesley Church. Over the past few weeks, we've been working on ways to continue to bring the church to you while we practice social distancing due to COVID-19. This week, we launched our growth groups and Bible studies online. Wesley Youth launched a brand new online worship series called Overflow, and Wesley Kids offered several online worship opportunities for your kids while they're at home. We continue to invite you to utilize our Right Now Media subscription that has hundreds of great studies for you to use, including some that fit perfectly with the current situation we are facing. Over the next few weeks, we plan to bring you more tools and updates, so make sure you subscribe to our emails, like our social media pages, and visit our website, wesleymethodist.com. Along with the updates, you can also visit the website to share your prayer requests and share your tithes and gifts with the church. This morning, we are going to be led in worship by Alyssa and Andy, and then led in prayer by Pastor Michael. The sermon this morning will be given by Pastor Megan about the redemption story of Ruth and Naomi. We are so glad you're here with us this morning. Let us come together and worship. What a beautiful thing it is to be dependent on the Lord this morning. Will you worship with me? Abide with me, fast full sleep in tide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me. presence in your word, in prayer, you change us from the inside out. And God, I pray that we take that and that we are a light to the world around us this week. God, even if we um, are still afraid, God, even if we're struggling with doubt, with confusion, and whatever that is, God, I pray you will replace those dark things with your light. Because, God, there can only be victory in your name. And we are so thankful to be um, your children and your followers. We love you so much. Amen. 
Hi friends, I'm Mike McIntyre. I'm one of the pastors here at Wesley, and I'd love to have you join with us in our opening prayer, which you can find printed right here on the screen. So can you join in with me? Let's pray. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hello, friends. So glad to be here with you to worship our Lord and Savior on this Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here checking in on a different way of worship, but our God is with us wherever we are. We're going to continue our Redeemed series today by looking at the story of Ruth. Michael talked to us last week about Moses, and he even mentioned the Passover. Well, today I want you to know that 50 days after the Passover, the Jews would celebrate a festival called Shavuot. It's also called Pentecost. It's actually when the church was born. And so we'll celebrate it this year on May 31st. Peter preached his first gospel sermon at that celebration of Pentecost, and 3,000 people were baptized. It's interesting that during the festival of the Passover for the Jews, the Passover, or the festival of Pentecost, during that festival, the entire book of Ruth would be read publicly. So it seems like there's this connection between the book of Ruth and the beginning of the church. Both are stories of redemption. Jesus came to redeem his church. And Ruth is the story of being redeemed by her kinsman redeemer. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. So let's go back to the story of Ruth. The setting is the country of Moab. And then later they'll go into Bethlehem in Israel. Now the time period was during the days of the judges. And so Israel would follow after God and then wander away. And God would raise up a judge, and the judge would set them right. And they would follow God for a little while. And then they would start following their own ways. And so that was a big cycle. And in that cycle, there's a young woman named Ruth. And her future looks really bright. She has an Israelite husband. She has a strong family ties with her sister-in-law and brother-in-law and with her in-laws, her mother-in-law. And, and then everything fell apart. Elimelech, the patriarch in this story, dies. And then there's a famine on top of that. And so they have to move out of Bethlehem, out of Israel even, to back to the country of Moab, where Ruth is from. Now, when they get there, tragedy continues to happen to them. Ruth's husband dies, and then her brother-in-law dies. And so this strong family unit is now left with just three women. They have no income, no protection, and basically no future. Future. Ruth, Orpah, and Naomi are left with nothing but their grief. Remember, this was a blessed family, a patriarch and two sons, promises of grandchildren and the continuation of their family. But then the family broke when those three men died. And in the Israelite mind, this family became an unfamily, and these women were in dire straits. So eventually, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, decided to leave Moab and return to her home village of Bethlehem. And Ruth faces a choice. She can either, either stay in Moab, like her sister-in-law, Orpah, or she can leave behind everything familiar and go with Naomi, her mother-in-law. Her words to Naomi give an amazing example of loyalty and love and faith. Ruth replied to Naomi, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. 
Now, I imagine Ruth would have been shocked to know that these words would become famous and used in millions of wedding ceremonies. It's not too surprising because the book of Ruth is actually considered a literary masterpiece. When Benjamin Franklin was ambassador to France, he was a part of a group that reviewed and critiqued literary masterpieces. And they called their group the Infidels Club. So that kind of tells you what they thought of the Bible. So one time, Benjamin Franklin tells them this story and changes the name so that they would not suspect that it was the story of Ruth. And when they finished the Bible, they were amazed at how beautiful it was, and they demanded to know where it was found. And Benjamin Franklin, I'm sure, was delighted to tell them it was straight from the Bible. This beautiful story does focus on Ruth, who's not an Israelite. She didn't grow up worshiping Yahweh, our Lord. Ruth grew up worshiping Chemesh, called the destroyer. That was the God of Moab. And it was from Naomi's family that Ruth learned about the God of Israel, God the creator. When it came time to choose, Ruth chose Yahweh over Chemosh. She chose the life giver over the destroyer. She chose not only to give her loyalty to Naomi, but also to give her loyalty to Naomi's God. Ruth took a big risk when she left behind everything that was familiar to her. This big step of faith set Ruth on a course that would cause her to become the mother of kings. I'm sure she never imagined it. Chapter 2, 22 says, So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. When Ruth went from Moab to Bethlehem, she had every reason to believe that she would be treated like a second-class citizen, a foreigner who didn't really belong. She had every reason to think that she would never have a chance to marry again and that she would die a childless widow. That's how things looked from an earthly perspective. But, not, but that's not how things turned out in God's provision. In the ancient Near East, the axis of life and community was the family. Israel's culture was patriarchal and family-based, as opposed to our very individually-based society that we have today. In ancient Israel, to exist was to be a part of a family. On the other hand, to be without a family was to be without legitimate existence. How did that work? Well, every family in Israel was built and sustained by its oldest living male relative, the patriarch. The role of the patriarch was to shepherd and to protect and sustain every member of his family, even the ones who were lost to sin, even the ones that were lost to enemies, and even those that were lost to just bad luck or unfortunate circumstances. This is where redemption comes in. Let's zoom in and act like we are looking at a family living in ancient Israel. Imagine a patriarch with many family members under his care. Suppose one of the, his distant relatives, his kinsmen, makes this deceitful oath and loses all of his land and money. The kinsman no longer has property or money, so he's cast into poverty. He's dislodged from the family unit, and he's left to exist on the margins of society. Word gets around, and the patriarch finds out, and here's the story. The Redeemer now knows. And so, by law, the patriarch is required to alleviate the situation and rescue his kinsmen. This was no small matter. To rescue a family member was incredibly costly and potentially dangerous. But that didn't matter because the law demanded that the patriarch protect the individual's legal and rights and cancel his debts. So keeping in line with his identity as well as the law, the pa- patriarch buys back the land that his kinsman had lost. He pays the kinsman's debt 
and he makes a live and he allows him to eat at his table and to make a living off of his land. This patriarch, this process, the act of the patriarch risking his life and his resources to rescue a lost family member is called redemption. And it was established as a law in the book of Leviticus. Now, their culture that's seen in the Bible um, doesn't mean that we are to continue to live by that culture. God continually corrected aspects of their culture to bring it in line with his values, just as God current, continually corrects our culture to bring it in, lies, in line with the value of the kingdom of God. So all we need to know is understand the culture so we can understand scripture. So how do these women survive in this culture? Well, as it turns out, there was a kinsman redeemer in Bethlehem. And his name was Boaz. And according to the Jewish law, the closest, closest relative of Ruth's deceased husband could buy back or redeem the right to own the family property. Boaz, now don't miss the point. This wasn't just a business deal. It's a love story. Boaz didn't want the land. He wanted to marry Ruth. He, Ruth, in fact, had caught Boaz's attention right away. He had fallen in love with Ruth as she gleaned in his fields to take care of her mother-in-law, Naomi. Read the story for yourself. It's too good to miss. Naomi is really the matchmaker. Ruth does her part to let Boaz know that she's interested. And Boaz goes through the proper channels to win the right to become her husband. As the story of Ruth unfolds, we see that to redeem in this situation means that Boaz will marry Ruth and buy back the patrimony of her deceased husband. She'll take both, he'll take both Ruth and Naomi into his household and father a child in Milan's name, thereby giving Elimelech an heir to the family inheritance. Now, we also learn in chapter 4 that there's a relative closer in kinship than Boaz. But he refused to redeem Ruth because he says it would jeopardize his own inheritance. So this points out that it is that Boaz was asked to do something costly. His generous actions put his own resources on the line. But in his integrity, Boaz chooses to embrace the responsibility of a patriarch and become Ruth's kinsman redeemer. Redemption was an action required by law of every patriarch in ancient Israel. It was to ransom a family member who had been driven to the margins of society by poverty, who had been seized by an enemy against whom he had no defense, or who found themselves enslaved by the consequences of a faithless life or just bad circumstances. The law demanded that the patriarch protect the individual's legal rights and resolve their debts. So here is a reconciliation of family ties that costs the Redeemer. It's the oldest, closest male relative to whom one looks for help and hope. Does this sound familiar? It should. The ancient tribal law is the blueprint for what Jesus has done with us. Jesus, the head of the family of God, acts in his identity as redeemer to rescue us from sin and death. Forsaking his royalty, his resources, and his life, he went to the depths to buy us back from a fate we rightfully deserved and he restored us to the security within his family, not because of some law, but because of love, love for us. So now we are perpetually under the care of our kinsman redeemer. Redemption alters our way of life because Jesus brought us back into the family. We now incorporate him into every aspect of our lives. We're nourished by him. We're led by him and taught by Jesus. Our status as outcast, as sinner, as rebel has been wiped away. We go to a, 
We now go by a different name as one redeemed by Jesus. We are established in his family and we are sons and daughters of the Lord Almighty. Ruth's story reminds me of God's promise in Ephesians 3.20. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can imagine. That's really been one of my favorite verses for a few years. Now this happy ending for Ruth included everything she could have imagined and more. A wonderful husband, a healthy baby son that had an adoring grandma, a place to call home in Bethlehem among God's people. And Ruth also was the great grandmother of King David. And Ruth is one of only four women who are named as ancestors of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. The New Testament gives two genealogies of Jesus Christ, and they are given to show that Jesus has the credentials to be the Messiah, that he was a descendant of King David. But Matthew gives this genealogy in a way that breaks with tr tradition because he names women. He names four women, Tamar and Ruth and Rahab and Bathsheba. Now it's interesting from these four women, two of them, Rahab and Ruth, they were outsiders. They were Gentiles like us. Um, Ruth is the only one that's actually not of ill repute. The others were women of sin, basically. So why would these four women be singled out in the genealogy of the king of kings? Well, the one thing that all four women had in common was faith. All four of these women believed in Yahweh's promises. Because of their faith, they were given the honor of being named in the Messiah's genealogy, the one who brings outsiders into God's family, the one who redeems sinners. <coughs> We know how Ruth's story turned out. None of us know yet the end of our stories, though. COVID-19 has brought fear into our lives. Maybe this will bring the end to the life of someone we love. Maybe it's an end to the life as we have known it. You know, fear is a God-given alarm to alert us to potential harm. Fear is a powerful and a much-needed alarm, but it makes for a terrible control. On the walls of your home, you probably have a smoke detector and a thermostat. One is an alarm. The other is a control. That smoke detector can't control whether there's smoke or not. It can only alert you to the presence of smoke. But the thermostat, on the other hand, can not only detect the temperature, but it can also control the temperature by turning your heater or your air conditioner on. Pay attention to your fears just like you do to the wail of a shrieking alarm. But don't let your fear become your thermostat because God is in control. God is our kinsman redeemer watching over us and his provision will cause more to happen than we could ever imagine for he can do much, much more than we can ask. In Christ's name, amen. Hey friends, please join me in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we want to give you praise and thanks for the fact that by your love and by your power, you chose to step in and quite literally step into our world and step into our lives to bring about redemption. We recognize that we're the ones who got ourselves in trouble. We're the ones who, who, who wandered away and now need to be saved, need to be redeemed. And so we just want to praise you for the fact that it's not because of who we are or what we've done that we are redeemed, but it's because of who you are. And it's because of what you were willing to do to redeem us and bring us back home. So we just want to praise you and we just want to thank you and we just want to glory in a love that is so powerful. Thank you, God, for our Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. May we forever serve him in love. May we forever lift up his praise. May our very lives bring glory and honor to his name. And now we ask that you would hear us as together, we lift up to you the prayer that he taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. opportunity for us to connect online. Um, God, we know that you're present through all the miracles, through all the wonders that you're doing in the midst of this chaos, God. Thank you for being the constant. Thank you for loving us. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. 
Hey friends, thanks so much for joining us at worship this morning. And I wanna give you a brief update on what's gonna be happening for Holy Week. So next Sunday at 10 a.m., we are going to have our Palm Sunday worship online. And then all of Holy Week, we'll have online services that are going to premiere at various times. But remember that when they premiere at that time, you can watch them anytime after that. So Palm Sunday, this coming Sunday at 10, then the following Thursday, on Maundy Thursday, we'll have our premiere at 7 o'clock, our premiere for Good Friday services at 7 o'clock, and then on Easter Sunday, we're going to have a 6.30 premiere of our Youth Sunrise service, and then our service at 10 o'clock. I hope you can join us for all of these. It's going to be something special, even if we can't get together. And then the last thing I want to let you know is this, is whenever it is that we can finally come come back together, whether that's late May or June, July, whenever it is, the very first Sunday we get to come back, we're going to have another Easter celebration. And this is going to be one of the most exciting ones ever because we're all going to be so excited and in a very real way, it's like the church itself has been resurrected. So we're going to join in the biggest Easter celebration of all of whenever that is. I don't know at this point and I know you don't either, but it's going to be special. Again, thanks for joining us. God bless. We love you, Wesley, and we'll see you soon.